I think you may want to keep that close. I do? Okay. <laughs> well, that was uh, unexpected. But fun. I hope so. It was fun for me. Well, uh, we will talk in a few minutes um, about your work with singers and with choirs, but I thought it might be useful to sort of start out a little bit about uh, by talking about where you came from and the, uh, the somewhat circuitous path you took to get to write film music in the 1990s. I came from the East. <laughs> far, far more than the East. Um, <laughs> East Sussex. Um, it, it was a circuitous path in the sense that I really was just trying to make music, actually. I mean, and now I'm just kind of clearing my career out a little bit. Um, I kind of don't need to worry and I can actually tell the truth, which is I just love making music and the great thing about the film world is that they, <laughs> you can trick them into giving you the best orchestras and the best singers in the world and you get to make music with them. And the only cost of it is that you have to try and make it fit their film. <laughs> um, but most of the time I'm really just trying to have the same fun that I had as a kid with music. Did you, um, let's, let's see, remind me where you uh, studied music? I studied at Trinity College of Music in London. And, and did you take um, any kind of uh, choral music um, history or classes or... No, no, but <laughs> the funny thing is, I must be honest that the singers were way more fun to hang out with. So I kind of, I did end up hanging out with a lot of singers. And in fact, one of the things that happened was there was a, a, an opera course on the college, and uh, a very good one. But it was very limited for the singers. There was a lot of very good singers there. And, and they would always be sitting in the common room complaining about the fact that, you know, there was only three roles and uh, there was 27 of them, you know. So I remember we talked and uh, myself and another composer sort of said, well, why don't we do something? So we started a kind of a group, an alternate um, opera group. And uh, I would, you know, uh, conduct a bit of that, which is terrible. But, you know, and uh, we'd get a, a pianist to come and accompany the singers. And I remember doing a bit of Midsummer Night's Dream Britain, um, doing uh, Yanis Kiki by um, Puccini, a few things. And we just did them, you know, just for ourselves sometimes and, and anyone that would come and watch in the, in the downstairs hall at um, a place called Hind Street, which is just behind Selfridges, which is where we were. So. And uh, in your period of time in the, in the 80s and the 90s when you were doing music for commercials and that sort of thing, did, uh, was there much choral work involved in any of that? Well, honestly, I, I, you have to remember that I came out of college in 1986 and I did age 22, and I didn't make any money till I was 30. So, and I've been trying to tell a few of the composers here, you know, you've got to understand, it's a long haul. At least it was for me. If you make money earlier than that, great, you're a genius, fine. But I didn't, so, you know, I had to find a woman, who I, did, I found a woman who, who had a car and an apartment. She was, uh, she was my subsistence. Uh, while I tried to work out what the hell I was doing, really. And um, so, no, I, I didn't get, I, you know, after college, I had all this experience, experience, fun, with singers. And then I went off, you know, for this dry period when, you know, I, I really couldn't get them. Once I got into the 90s, yes, I was doing adverts, and then you kind of get the odd singer here and there to do things, but never a choir or anything like that. I, you know, you just couldn't afford it. So I didn't really, my experience with singers kind of just didn't really start again, honestly, a couple of times, a few bits and pieces, but really didn't start until Happy Feet, I meant E.D., e e you know, here. And, and before we get to that, what prompted your move to the United States? I'm an economic migrant. Uh, there is not enough work in England, so I came here. I mean, it's really that simple. You know, you go where the work is. And also, also you go where the, the music is. I mean, I, I was following the fact that I had the preferences of big symphonic sound. I desperately wanted to do that kind of score. And so you kind of, you look around and, you know, you could do TV in London, and I did a bit of uh, TV, but it would generally be, you know, six, eight, twelve players. You couldn't really ever get the budgets to do this, and the films were very hard to, there were few, few and far between. 
you know, how do you get into it? Ironically, I didn't get to an English film until I came to Hollywood and then went back with Chicken Run. That was the first sort of British film I did. And I would never have got it if I hadn't come here. So um, truly, you know, economics really led me here. You, you spent a few years uh, at uh, what used to be Media Ventures uh, with Hans Zimmer and Harry Gregson Williams. What, uh, what, what uh, did that period do for you as a composer? Um, well, it gave me rickets. Um, because you, you're not allowed out. It's like, <laughs> it's like being a veal. <laughs> with, without a massage. <laughs> So, um, so then, but it does give you a community of composers, and, and, and the hard thing is, another thing I'd like to just say is that everyone thinks I'm a really nice guy, but honestly, to get anywhere in this business, there's a lot of really nice guys who are really good composers, and there's a lot of assholes who are really good composers. So the question is, how do you get ahead? So, at Media, I was last on the line of 15 people. There's great composers there, all ahead of me. How did I get there? So I, I honestly, I just kind of, I sucked up to mummy. I mean, you know, I, I basically tried to write music that not necessarily was good for the film or the project or whatever I was doing, but would, would get hands to take notice of me. So I wrote stupid, crazy stuff. Um, <laughs> anything I could think of that would really kind of have a flag that he'd notice me above the rest of the crowd. And even though I loved everybody there, you know, I was, I was determined to sort of try and get ahead. And the only way really was to have the main guy, you know, notice you. And that was how I did it. So that and sex. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's touch on that for a minute. <laughs> boom, boom. <laughs> so, so was Happy Feet your first um, opportunity to use singers in any great way? Well, I was, <laughs> I was really hired for Mad Max 4 by George Miller. Okay, and then at the meeting he said, oh, and by the way, there's this other film. And so, and he kind of decided that he needed somebody who could do an action film and animation and all this other stuff. And he was looking around for somebody, because he was looking to, what's the word, amortize the cost of flights. I'm not kidding about this. So it's like, if, you're, if, you, if they go fly to Australia and it's gonna cost, you know, $5,000, they want it to work for at least two films, you know. So, so I was kind of hired on both films, but then one of them didn't happen, which was Mad Max. So I ended up on this animation film, and, and until then, if you did songs for an animation, you know, there was a particular way of doing it. You'd book singers, you'd have a, you know, a SAG day with the singers. You'd uh, have a band, maybe record the backing track. And just in early conversations with George, I, I realized this wasn't ever going to work. He basically was trying to create a musical with uh, thousands of records. And we, didn't, we couldn't use those records, so we had to make the records, as it were. We had to try and find all the bits. And it was the, I can't remember who introduced me to Edie, but Edie basically came in and I talked to her. And I said, look, how are we going to do this? Because I need to do lots and lots of sessions. And I was thinking, you know, you know, 10 sessions like that. But it was looking like for, you know, in the early stages of that, I'd never be able to get, persuade them to let me do that at all the other rates. And she said, no, 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 we've got, we've got a rate, special rate. And she figured out how to let us play, or how to let me play. And so what I had the opportunity was, I had singers would come in, and it really wouldn't cost very much, wouldn't cost the production that much. And I would play and would try things out and I'd send it to George and I'd meet with George and I'd try and other things out and play and then we'd have a whim, a fancy and we'd try it all out. So, so 125 sessions later. <laughs> but I think it all worked out for everybody because what I learned throughout that whole process was that th this was a new thing for me. I mean, literally, you know, okay, so you've, you guys have all smoked, blown a bit of smoke up my ass. I'm not blowing smoke up your, you guys' asses. It's just that there isn't actually nowhere else in the world that we could have done this because what I was finding was that I had singers who I could ask to do anything, and they could. I mean, anything. You know, and it, it was extraordinary. So we could literally, I had the same people doing Pagliacci as doing, you know, um, Destiny's Child. 
on the same session. I mean, where else could you do that? So we had we started to sort of have fun with the songs because obviously the whole idea of Happy Food was heart songs. So we needed to be able to try any song in the popular repertoire. And then we brought it, you know, then and Edie introduced me to more and more amazing singers, you know. And so we just kept playing that way, and, and I've just loved the process ever since. I mean, she's got me out of so many scrapes, you know. <laughs> but you're also great at utilizing the human voice in your underscores in films as well. And I wonder if you can sort of talk about the role of um, the human voice uh, as um, an adjunct to what you're trying to achieve mood-wise or uh, emotionally. It's a cheap trick. It really, it really is. Honestly, it's, it's a total shorthand. You can get to an emotional place that you can't get to with strings, with, with a, a choir, just instantly. I don't know what it is. I mean, I know what it is. Is that we've lived forever with the vocal, with the sound of our voices, you know, with with singing. It's the oldest instrument, as it were, that we've ever had. Um, it comes from, you know, our our history, our deep history, our personal history. And so, instantly, you give anything. You can give a chord sequence on a piano. You can give it to strings, and then you can give it to voices, and it just one wins when you need an instant emotion. And then what else are we doing in film other than completely manipulating people? And that's incredibly useful. And do you, um, how do you make those decisions, by the way? What are the circumstances under which you uh, choose to use choir? Um, desperation, you know, it's like, you've got, <laughs> it's normally five minutes before the, honestly, this is how the meetings go. So you've got something, you play them a tune, and they're kind of like, mm. and then you try and make it a little lusher on some strings, and, mm. and you think, oh God, this is a good tune. I think this is a good tune. How am I going to get this past? And you grab a choir sample, and then suddenly they're all a puddle on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, easy. Right. And then you say, I need a little bit more money. Well, that's, again, that's the other thing is that I, you know, this has been very interesting for me because. Edie and SAG and AFTRA as well have been incredibly flexible. And we went from people telling me, no, you can't have a choir in London, and me saying to Edie, I can't do choirs here, they, they, don't, they want me to do it ISDN to London, to literally weeks let, later having a three hour session uh, with, with choir, you know, instead of eight hours. I mean, because that's the thing is that you can do a lot with, with choir in three hours. And you know, when they're good and they read, you can get through a, a vast amount of music and, and you just want it as this colour, you want to be able to throw this colour here and there in the score. And sometimes they, they just won't give you the budget for the full eight hour day. So having the three hour or four hour session is perfect. And it just allowed us to bring a lot more choral work back here, I think. And that was smart, that was very smart. And, uh, there were other issues like, um, you know, we couldn't, I, I used to get into trouble sequencing albums because it used to be that if a choir was on the album, you had to, it, the, the length of the track, which could be a six minute track with a minute of choir on it, had to allow, you know, be six minutes, and then it would all add up and it would get too expensive, and the record companies would say, no way can you stick the choirs on, can you put the synth choirs on? And I hated that, so I used to make these tiny tracks that were only a minute long. It used to drive people mad, apparently. I, I apologize to anybody who, who, you know, has listened to the soundtracks and thought, why is that track suddenly a minute? And, you know, well, it was just make sure that I got the real choir on there. And again, they figured this out. Now, now you know, you can, you can get them on. You can, you can use as much choir as you like. We've talked a little bit about the Happy Feet films. Um, this reel was genuinely spectacular in, in showcasing so many of the various styles that you've used throughout the, year, throughout the years. And, and I'm a huge fan of the Rio films in particular, in terms of the kind of material you, you wrote and arranged and these people performed. Can you talk a little bit about um, what it took to sort of get into the mind of the Latin American music? Well, it, it, uh, that, that Sergio Mendes helped me do that. Well, actually, Chester Griffiths did that, who's here tonight. You know, so this, the story is, this is how it begins. It's like, I, I run into, 
my son's father Sunday at, at preschool. Okay, I'm late because I'm late. Because um, I was thinking about something. So I get there, and the other man, the other father who's late is Chester. Now he's in scrubs, and he's got blood splattered all over him. And I looked at him and I said, okay, you've got an excuse, I don't. You know? And so we started to talk, and we got on very well. We were outside the room. Everybody else was sat in a nice circle with their children. We were stuck outside because we missed it. And... Um, <laughs> And, uh, and he said to me, you know, he said, what, what are you doing? I said, well, I just was given a script um, for Rio. And he said, oh, you've got to do it. It's the greatest place on earth. You have to do this film. And really, that's probably why I did it. I mean, you know, that and when Sergio got involved and knowing Carlos as I did. But, you know, Rio is, is really just an extension of, of, of great love of, of Latin American music. It got very specific, Brazilian. Once I met Sergio, and he, <laughs> he reminded me that Brazilians are, sound totally different from the rest of Latin America, um, which you know, now seems obvious, but at the time I was a bit of a dolt on, so you know, <laughs> I was embarrassing myself. <laughs> me too. <laughs> well, you know, once you start putting the wrong clave rhythm in, and, the, and everyone looks at you like you've farted, it's very weird. <laughs> <laughs> Was Rio 2 much of a different experience? Was it easier because you'd already gone through Rio? Mm, yes and no. It was, it was just as much. I mean, the really, I tried to reduce the films I was going to do, and I wasn't going to do anything, honestly. And, uh, and then, you know, I, <laughs> I would have dreams and, and Sergio's face saying, John, you have to do the film. <laughs> but can't wait to do it. And so I, I, I went back, really, because of Sergio. And, um, and we had great fun again, and I, I, I loved the film. And, and the, the thing was, with this one, because it was out of Rio, it was more about Brazil, and Brazil is just a, oh, God. I mean, Rio's got plenty of music within it, but yeah, Brazil itself is just is a smorgasbord. Absolutely. Yeah, it's very diverse. Yes, because there's so many different kind of people have, have, have landed there for different reasons, and, uh, and they have their own styles of music, so you can take those and play with them. It's great fun. One of the, many of the, the funniest films that you've done have been those Ice Age pictures. And I wonder if you could talk for a second about some of the wacky things you were able to do vocally in the Ice Age movies. Well, well the, the one that is famous is the, well, famous amongst the, in this room, um, <laughs> is, uh, is the, uh, the monkey charm stuff, which is... And it's funny how the, one of the most important things at my college, at Trinity College of Music, was in the basement, the deep, dank basement, where they had an amazing record collection, which included a lot of ethnic music, a lot of world music. And until that point, I'd never written since 1982, and I'd never really heard much you know, world music. And I remember sitting down there, going through records, and finding this uh, in Indonesian record of a monkey chant, and thinking, what the hell is that? So cut to Ice Age, and we're sitting there, and we have this moment with Sid and the fire, and all the mini sloths, and and it's not working. They have a song. They have a song. I can't remember if it was ACDC or something like that. They had a song. It was moderately funny, but it just wasn't working. And everybody kind of said, oh, "All right, well, if we're not going to do that, what are we going to do?" And I said, "Well." What if he's like Prince and he's just kind of he's singing things and they're responding and so everyone said, oh, that's quite interesting. But w you know, what might it sound like? And I had no way of showing them that. I said, well, but they could get into kind of fun rhythms and fun fun responses and things. Well, what would that sound like? And I suddenly remembered at that moment this Indonesian monkey chant. So I put the record on and everyone's you know jaw drops. I was like, what the hell is that? <laughs> <laughs> we like that. <laughs> Great, do that. <laughs> and so they, they leave the room and you go, how the hell do I do that? <laughs> it's, like, it's literally 500, 500 men all sitting in a semicircle, as you saw in there. It's an avatar as well. And, uh, and they sit there and you know, this is, uh, you know, they like you to think it's a really ancient thing, but actually it's only been for, since about the last hundred years, and they generally only do it for visitors. Um, so, but it's a, it's a very precise kind of interlocking rhythm system, and it's extraordinary. So I had to sit there, really studying this stuff, trying to figure out how to do it. And then I brought a group of singers in, and, uh, and we sort of sat around, and I said, okay, well, 
let's start. So we, we just kind of started. I, I have the session here, so I'll show you later, you know, the, the, the guts of it. So. Oh, that'll be fun. Well, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> Do you conduct um, when you've got a choir, or do you uh, have someone else do that? No, no, I, I, I generally like um, to stay in the box and, and listen from the... Because there's so many elements going on. I, I mean, I'd love to be out there. I mean, again, if you remember back to the early statements, I'm really here just to make music. I would love to be out there with, with the singers, with the musicians. But unfortunately, I have this job that, you know, I have a contract, and. You know, I have to try and be responsible, so I stay in and listen. Responsible? Yeah. So, uh, the thing about the singers is that they're, A, they're always great fun. So I just sit in the box, and, and Edie normally conducts for me. Um, and, and, but I get to occasionally press the button and make a stupid comment. So <laughs> what are some of your most fun moments with your singers over the last 10 years? Um, there was an ending that we had to, to Happy Feet. I don't have it with me, I don't think, but it really made me laugh. It was, it was, <laughs> it was uh, all the kind of the, the, the males, the deep liturgical males, um, and they start singing. And um, what the idea was, was to, to get them to sing What a Fool Believes. Okay, and so they started, you know, what a fool believes. So really slow, and we did it really slow, and it gets faster and faster and faster and faster. And I just had a great group of singers, and, and they were, I, I might have the recording of it, but, and it just made me laugh, because these, right in front of your ears, you hear this group of, you know, old elders you know, singing this song that you can't quite work out what it is at first, and then suddenly they slowly speed up and start to groove. And before you know it, it's just, it, it was, that, I, that I remember was a moment, I laughed my ass off, absolutely <laughs> laughed my ass off. Um, other moments, uh, you know, I remember with a large choir, um, uh, you know, of women, I, I think we had about 60 women or something like that. And I remember I was trying to encourage them to be more, Use more vibrato. What film was it? Oh, I can't. It's probably one of the Ice Ages, I think. And I was, you know, I really wanted it. It was one of the moments probably where we were with Scrat and we were using Cacciatore or something like that. And I really wanted it to go. And and I eventually said, How many children have we got here? See, <laughs> <laughs> Edie knows what I'm, I'm going to get. And I I tried every other kind of adjective I could. To try and, and I said, ladies, I'm sorry, but there's only one word for this, which is orgasm. <laughs> and God, if they didn't just hit it right. <laughs> Talk about the versatility of the Los Angeles choir. <laughs> You're now taking on a very large scale project that will involve singers. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that. I thought you meant the, the woodworking thing. <laughs> but no. Um, the singles were, yes. Unfortunately, uh, it's not here. But um, yeah, I'm trying to write uh, an oratorio um, for... I'll record it next summer, I think. And then it's performed in 2016 in the Festival Hall with the Philharmonia Orchestra and the Philharmonia Choir. Um, it's based on a kind of an idea I had about the um, First World War about one particular character in the First World War. So it's, you know, it's a war requiem, uh, but without the requiem. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to write some other things as well. I'm just trying to really see if I can find another voice, find some interesting things musically. And, and, have, you, and have you been inspired to write that in part because of your experiences with singers? Very probably, yes. I mean, I've, I've had such, you know, luck with singers <laughs> here. And, uh, and the, the power of it, you know, just, it never leaves you. When, it, when you take it from, it, it's just even on Rio, we, we had some choral parts and um, I don't think we could get into Fox. So I said, okay, we'll, we'll just have 16 singers in my studio, which isn't huge. Uh, and the 16 singers came in and we did some, we, we tracked them a few times. Um, and I often, you know, utilize a, a way of making it sound larger by they sing forwards, they sing sideways, they sing rear. 
you know, and, the, and she's singing into the room at different angles, sometimes really, you know, broadens the scope of it. Maybe a slight vary speed as well. And, you know, I got a totally choral, huge, massive choral sound, just, you know, with 16 singers. It was, it was fantastic. It sounded like, you know, a 200-piece choir, absolutely sort of blasting at you. So, um, I mean, being able to do that, I did a, another thing which was for the uh, Contemporary Art Museum in Palm Springs. Uh, we did a piece where we sang, or where we, uh, Gavin Greenaway, uh, Simon Greenaway's brother, and I <coughs> have been writing with Michael Petrie, Jermaine's brother. We've been writing since we were at college. And so we wrote, he wrote a text, Michael wrote a text, and Gavin wrote uh, the male part of it, which was recorded in London with um, 16 men, singers. And then I, I recorded the female part, which was gospel, uh, here uh, in L.A. Again, we had probably only eight singers and managed to get this huge gospel sound. And I actually made that into another orchestral piece as well uh, for gospel choir and orchestra that we hope to record next year as well. So. There are a number of young composers in the room tonight, and I wonder... Give up. <laughs> and, and my question was going to be, what advice would you give them? I give you the don't get you don't get any money till you're 30. You have to find a woman with a a, a car and an apartment. Um, um, what else is there? I mean, the advice I would give is again, you know, search for your own voice because there's so many people can do do it. You have to just try and find a way of sticking ahead above everybody else. Um, you know, you might think getting to media ventures is is all you need. Well, I had to fight like buggery to, to get out in front of everybody else there. So, you know, it's not a fait accompli once you get to certain points. Every point is, requires another fight, another selfish action on your part to try and, you know, achieve the next level. And it's, it's exhausting. Um, obviously, it's, it's fun. I, I, I just realized early on that if I, if I was going to get to make the music I wanted to make, and persuade film companies to pay for it, I would have to try and work very hard for them. And I think uh, that's the main thing, is that you have to be tenacious. And I think that we've seen tonight how hard you've worked, and we're all grateful. <laughs> okay. So, can you give us a little preview of what we're uh, in for? Uh, for the next uh, few minutes. I don't know. I mean, uh, I'm going to attempt to uh, open some sessions, logic sessions. Um, I will see if they crash or not. They may crash. <laughs> All right. I'll just say thank you and now I'll turn you over to John Powell.